Hey everybody, Sean Fury here with Sean Fury's Strategy and Support Services. I wanted to do a little training today about personal empowerment or personal power, right? Um, how to develop influence, uh, impact, and make sure that the influence that you're using in your day-to-day -day life is having a positive impact, right? So you could say that at the end of this training, hopefully the knowledge that is included in this training uh, will help you if you apply it to increase your positive impact potential so that no matter where you are, whatever's happening, you'll be more likely to be the person that's able to intervene and improve your world, right? So whatever's happening, you're the person that is going to make the difference and hopefully either create a positive thing or protect something positive that's already happening, right? Um, so real quick, uh, I've been uh, studying heroism for about, you know, nine years, I think. And I've put together a number of YouTube videos and stuff on the internet that people can check out at my YouTube channel. It's called Hero Support Guy. And uh, I thought I'd take some of that material and put it together in this uh, personal empowerment training to just focus strictly on you, the person that has power, and to do a little um, education around what it means to have power, why it's okay to use your power, what that power really is, why it's important, what I think it's for, and uh, what's not okay to do with it, right? What, what it's not for. And let's talk maybe for a little bit during our training about uh, the ways that people are using their power you know, incorrectly. And uh, what I mean by that is they're using it in ways that have a destructive effect on themselves, on their own relationships with other people, and on their own ability to make progress toward their own personal goals, right? So uh, if that's something that interests you, stick around and uh, enjoy this content. Um, I have almost 15 years of experience as a behavioral health professional. And um, so I've been able to learn from people who are homeless, people that were addicted, people who were incarcerated, uh, kids in group homes, my own experiences, and my own family as the oldest of four kids growing up in a family where there was a lot of different stuff happening. And uh, my parents did the best they could, you know, but they made some mistakes. And uh, because I didn't want to repeat those mistakes, I tried to study cultural icons and heroes and learn as much as I could about what people did that seemed to be having positive life outcomes or seem to be creating positive changes in their own communities or in their own lives. And I tried my best to uh, sort of deconstruct those stories, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, uh, John F. Kennedy, all those stories, even fake stories, right? Like comic book characters, Superman, Batman, movies like Harry Potter, um, studying all those different things and even studying the bad guys in movies, right? The Terminator or the Joker, or Voldemort, and trying to figure out what they were all doing and how it all relates to everyday people. And what I figured out is how it relates is that each of us is on a journey uh, to become an empowered individual, which could also just mean a fully mature adult human being someone who is capable of creating and protecting the kinds of situations in their day-to-day -day life uh, at home or at school or at work or at church, or wherever you are, creating the kinds of situations in which people like you and other living beings as well can be well and flourish, right, while they're alive. So uh, stay tuned and we'll get started. So I mentioned that each of us has a power. I like to jokingly refer to that as our not so secret superpower. It's not so secret because it's kind of obvious, but it's significant at the same time because other creatures on the planet either don't have this power or they have a much more diminished version of this power. 
and that is that your not so secret superpower is the ability to influence situations that's right you have the ability to influence people places events and the outcomes of events right so where did you get this power well you're born with it everybody has it and uh, but not everybody knows how to use it right and a lot of times we get taught to use this power in ways that are self-defeating we end up doing things with our power uh, you could say we shoot ourselves in the foot and we sabotage our own abilities to be successful in life as human beings and as individuals with personal goals so let's take a few minutes to talk some more about this power so one thing about this power to influence situations that's interesting is that it's natural even animals have this power right um, a tree can grow upward right and you know express its uniqueness uh, through the leaves on its branches but it can't move around of its own free will right it doesn't have one but animals can do that they can move around right and they can maybe go uh, try to find help for some other animal that's hurting or for someone that they care about like you might see like a dog do that with its uh, owner um, but you know I used to have a cat in an apartment and when my cat wanted to go outside it couldn't just go outside I had to let it out of the house so you can see how I have more influence than my cat and that's great so anybody can you know let their cat out of the house uh, but not everybody is even using their power of influence as much as they could um, sometimes it's funny because animals use their power even more than people uh, there's a funny video on the internet of a raccoon mother and a raccoon father helping to lift their little raccoon babies up over a rock wall uh, next to the road and somebody drove by and took the video and you can see how the raccoon parents are both using their power of influence to help their babies get over a rock wall and that's really amazing right because it shows that they're really aware of the danger of the road and of wanting to get over the, the rock wall and of the importance of working together like I think one of the raccoons is holding the other one's like legs or something while the other one reaches the babies it's amazing sometimes you, there's videos online of you know dogs jumping in the river to save another dog and I saw one where a dog was about to go over a waterfall and this other dog grabbed a stick and the other dog bit onto it so it's almost as if um, you know animals are using their influence it's natural and people are using their influence most of the time we don't do it on purpose people do a lot of things just you know kind of flying on autopilot they're not really thinking about what they're doing um, but then there's some of us that really are doing things consciously and intentionally and and we're gonna be more influential right so you can see how there's like degrees of influence that different beings that we have here on earth are using uh, different degrees of influence are being you know implemented so first thing I want you to know is why you can use this power and uh, the answer to me is intuitively obvious right take a look around at the external world called reality and remember what you know scientists originally described as the universal law of cause and effect one thing happens and it causes a reaction like I showed on the previous slide the dominoes you push one domino over and it pushes into the next one causing a chain reaction so you were born with the faculties of mind and body uh, that allow you to interact with this cause and effect sequence of day-to-day -day reality in other words what are those faculties it's your imagination your thoughtful mind your free will and your hands your feet your voice right um, in other words reality is like the canvas that I'm showing in the picture on the slide and you are like the painter 
with the paintbrush and the paints. Um, your, the paints are kind of like your choices, right? So you decide what kind of picture you're going to paint. You decide what you want to see happen. And so obviously I'm not su suggesting that you're, you know, God or the creator of the universe or anything, but simply that you appear to have uh, the, the ability and the permission to use this power of influence, right? Because you were born with it. You didn't have to ask for it. You didn't have to do anything to earn it. You just were given this ability by whatever, natural selection, evolution, intelligent design, uh, randomness, chaos, who knows what it was. But somehow, for some reason, you were born with the ability to tap into uh, the cause and effect sequence of day-to-day -day reality and use your power of influence to shape the situation around you that you're in um, and thereby to influence the kind of outcomes that you and others experience. So in other words, if you want to have better experiences, you could use this power um, by shaping the situations that you're in and thereby changing the experiences that you're having, right? So that's pretty awesome. All right, we'll continue here. The next thing that's important to know is why you should use your power of influence. Um, I like to show a little puppet on a string here to convey the idea that if you're not using your power intentionally, then you're going to be automatically using it um, flying on autopilot. What I mean by that is that each of us has a conscious mind and a subconscious mind, right? Your conscious mind is the you that's awake right now watching this PowerPoint presentation, the you that's hearing me talk. But your subconscious mind is the you that's awake when this part of you is asleep. So when you're sleeping at night, the part of you that's dreaming is the subconscious. And that's uh, what uh, I like, I like uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton. He's, he's a guy who talks a lot about uh, reprogramming the subconscious in order to change habits. But he describes that as your habit mind. And uh, he describes your conscious mind as the creative mind. And he likes to say that, you know, your creative mind is willing to do new things, but your habit mind is not willing to do new things. It flies on autopilot. And it was programmed back when you were a kid by the things that you observed people doing around you, right? So you learned how to be a person in the world by watching mom and dad and your brother and sisters and your teacher and the people at school and on the bus and on at church. And uh, it's possible that you might have learned ways of doing things that are actually not that good for you or for other people. Like maybe you got taught that when you're upset, it's okay to act out, to use your influence in a way that's violent and aggressive, right? Or aggressive and violent. Maybe you got taught that it's okay to let other people hurt you. And that's part of your role in life is to allow yourself to be mistreated because that's what your mom or dad showed you that a good person is, is someone that's a doormat, right? But you intuitively know that you don't really like that feeling. You don't really want it to be that way, but you struggle with knowing like how to do anything different, right? And so this is all kind of related to personal empowerment and training in particular. What is empowerment? When is it not okay to use your power, right? These are things we're talking about today. So the reason you should use your power of influence consciously to create your day-to-day -day life, uh, to improve your situation right now uh, so that you can create your future is because people who create their futures tend to have better ones, right? If we don't create our future consciously, then somebody else will. And I don't know about you, but I don't feel that great just letting anybody else uh, drive the car of my life without my consent, right? So uh, let's keep going. So knowing that you have this power to influence situations and being aware uh, that you are using it consciously is really important uh, because it means that you understand your role as an agent of influence in your day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, this is a way of describing what I call a change agent. Um, and it doesn't mean anything, you know, crazy. It, it just describes someone that is able to 
tap into the cause and effect sequence of day-to-day -day life and alter the flow of events if they wanted to, right? Like if something started to happen in a certain way and you didn't really want it to happen that way, you don't just have to go along with it. You can try to intervene on your own behalf or on behalf of others to alter that flow of events. Uh, just like if a river was flowing uh, in a certain direction and I didn't really want it to, um, if I had the tools and the equipment, I could uh, take action to uh, intervene and get that river to flow in a different direction, right? With, with the permission of like the city or town council or whoever. Uh, so a washer machine is a change agent because guess what? It changes clothes from dry to wet. A dryer is a change agent. It changes clothes from wet to dry. So anybody that's using their influence to, to influence things is a change agent. And um, the other reason well, I didn't mention in the last slide, but the other reason why you should use your power to influence things consciously is because you're already doing it anyways. Uh, you, you just might not be doing it consciously uh, because there's no way to not be an a change agent there's no way to not be an agent of influence you may remember that song free will by the band rush that says even if you choose not to decide you still have made a choice right i call that the action of non-action you might think i'm not going to get involved here well that's your choice you just did get involved by not getting involved right so uh, you're always having an influence whether you want to or not you may think it's wrong to get involved or not a good idea, and that's fine. Um, it's up to you to choose, you know, when and how you get involved with things. And uh, it's important that you have a legitimate claim to the turf. But uh, no matter how you choose to get involved, you may get involved uh, as a sidekick for someone else. Um, what I call uh, an unintentionally constructive change agent, right? Someone who is uh, willing to help and able to set limits when necessary in order to protect a good situation but they really don't want to go out and take initiative and like confront uh evil or destructive uses of uh, power or you might be a kind of change agent that doesn't get involved right now um and what we call a bystander and so you're not really having any influence right um kind of a pre-change agent there another third example is the one in the movies that we call villain. And that's those more obvious examples of uh, someone who uses their power in a way that's meant to dominate the will of others or to use them um, as an object, uh, disregarding their humanity. Um, I call that an intentional, um, intentionally, uh, excuse me, an intentionally destructive change agent. And then lastly, the fourth kind of change agent that's really obvious and important that we are trying to encourage you to be here today is what I call the intentionally constructive change agent. And that's someone that uses their power for good. And they have a high level of influence because they've developed the uh, knowledge and the skills and the habits and the support that they need, the personal traits uh, necessary to have a positive impact, a high degree or high level of positive impact potential and that's what we uh, refer to as the hero in the movies right uh, in the story structure world for authors and movie script writers the hero is the main character of a story uh, or it's someone who overcomes obstacles right or might fight uh, a villain whatever that might be the dragon in the cave right or some kind of monster or whatever form of a problem that they're facing in their day-to-day -day life and uh, by attempting to move through what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey they move from a state of not knowing there's a problem uh, into a state of being aware that there's a problem eventually choosing to get involved and confront the problem learning how to do it developing skills facing the problem going through that ordeal of conflict uh, as they grapple with addressing the problem. Usually they get some sort of reward once they've initiated a positive change um, or found some sort of solution and implemented it. And then they try to return to business as usual, having uh, influenced things in a positive way, 
only to find out that before they can really return back to business as usual, they need to uh, go through a, a process of protecting that positive change that they've made where, you know, the problem that they've knocked down isn't knocked out and it's going to come back and uh, bring some of its friends and see if they can, you know, motivate you to go back to the way you were before. And uh, so that makes you a change agent. The only one that's really able to get through that problem solving process um, effectively is the one we call the hero. And that's why I say that we're all on a journey developmentally to become a hero or an empowered individual, right? It doesn't mean you're gonna be wearing tights and a cape. It doesn't mean you're gonna fly or try to. Uh, what it means is that you're just gonna be someone with a high level of personal power or agency, the ability to start and initiate a course of action and to complete it, right? So uh, heroes are people that have initiative, follow through, they work as a team, and they know how to protect the change that they've made, right? That's just a brief little overview of a couple other things we'll talk about shortly. Uh, but let's continue. So why do you have this power, right? What's it for? I believe that the reason you have this power is so that you can intervene and improve situations. So when situations are happening uh, randomly, you can get involved and uh, improve things if needed. I, I like to say there's three basic kinds of situations, right? There's one that is uh, situations that are supportive of your goals, things that you want to accomplish or do or achieve. And when the situation's supportive, when people are supportive and the social norms of the situation are supportive or the code of conduct allows you to take those steps, then you're going to go ahead and take those steps, right? And take advantage of that support. And uh, a second kind of situation is one that is neutral, right? The people in the, the environment don't really care whether you take steps forward toward your goals and they're not going to stop you and they don't really say that it's a problem or anything and you can't see how it would be so you take advantage of that and you move forward toward your goals and then the third kind of situation is the one that's antagonistic one where the people maybe don't want you to make it or there's one person that doesn't want you to keep going or they don't like the change you're making or maybe there's a group of people that would rather you gave up so they try to bully you or team up against you somehow to get you to doubt yourself or to give in or give up, right? And uh, so then you're gonna have to figure out how to navigate around that power struggle, right? Or that culture conflict that might be occurring so that you can move you know, out of whatever comfort zone or discomfort zone you're in, right? The, the uncomfortable norm that you're used to. Uh, you might have to move through what I call the conflict zone uh, and deal with those people socially in some way or those situations that whatever the variables are that are kind of getting in your way and trying to block you they're acting as hurdles right obstacles and opposition trying to slow you down or hinder your ability to make forward movement right kind of reminds me of like Han Solo and Chewbacca when they're in the Millennium Falcon and they're flying through an asteroid field. They have to learn how to navigate and weave around all those possible uh, threats to getting to their goal. Um, so you have this power in order to improve situations. What, what's the point of improving situations, right? Well, I think the, the main obvious one is that as a human being, it's important for you to be in nutrient-rich social environments. Uh, so that you can reach your full potential and achieve what we call self-actualization. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a state of life experience or beingness where you get to be your best self. You get to be the fully mature, fully realized version of yourself. And when you look around at your situation, you kind of see a world that reflects you, right? Um, not uh, only you, but things you like, right? You're doing a job that you like. You're hanging out with people that you want to hang around with. You're engaging in activities that you want to do. 
they bring joy to you. You feel very high, uh, a sense of euphoria naturally when you're doing these things, right? And they, they release uh, endorphins, those naturally occurring good chemical uh, chemicals, you know, in your body and your brain that are released when you're engaging in activities that make you feel good, like social laughter, um, achievements, right? Engaging in a variety of fun activities. Uh, these are all reasons to get involved and make life better for yourself, right? So that you can have a better experience. Uh, so by intervening to improve situations, taking advantage of good situations in which you're uh, encouraged to make progress toward your goals, in which people want to boost your power, uh, they want to support you with, you know, maybe money or social support, or they want to encourage you, or they want to help you create a plan. These are all things that will help you to get further uh, faster, right? That you can get further with their, with their help uh, than you could on your own. And uh, hopefully you can stay there longer than you would on your own. And it won't take you 50 years to figure out how to get somewhere, right? When you have support and you have help and uh, you can kind of learn things that other people might be able to help you learn uh, that they've already learned. So it won't take you forever to figure it out on your own. Uh, so you have this power so that A, you can achieve self-actualization, B, so that you can have a high quality social experience in your day-to-day -day life, wherever you are, uh, when possible, assuming that, you know, you're being supported by other people that also want that same overarching goal. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you have this power so that you can make progress toward your personal goals, right? And hopefully by doing all of these things combined, you'll be creating and protecting the kind of situations in which you and your offspring, your kids and your family uh, and your communities, right? The people that interact with you and depend on you, uh, you'll all be able to be well emotionally uh, and to flourish as living beings, to thrive right at the peak of, to reach your full potential in life you know like the lion is at the peak of its game you know the lion roars the eagle soars the acorn becomes the mighty oak and uh, Abraham Maslow talked a lot about that type of stuff um, and so when you get those basic needs met like that he talked about for safety and you know housing and food and you got that base of operations set up uh, then you can also pursue social experiences at home at work, at school, at church, experiences like, the, I mean, when I say social experiences, what I mean is experiences that other people can ruin for you if they want, right? Or they can help to cultivate those experiences. Experiences that are what I call um, dignity. It feels like equality of value, right? It looks like dignity. It feels like equality of value. This is one that at my job we value, and I really like that. Um, other ones that we also do and that you guys can do too and I use in my personal life is, you know, making sure the situation is physically secure, right? So that people can feel safe. Um, try to help people to have an optimistic outlook so that they can have hope, right? Um, other examples might be supporting people so that they feel respected or being authentic with people, being who I really am so that they can feel like, Sean is being transparent with them and um, you know maybe I'm being socially vulnerable with them I'm I'm telling them what I really think and feel even when it's awkward and uncomfortable as long as I feel safe to do that around them and that they're not gonna use that information that I give them in a way that's detrimental to me and my goals um, if I can do that with them they're gonna be more likely to see me as trustworthy right so if I want to experience those good experiences like trust and safety and respect and equality, hope and others, uh, then I can intervene in ways that bring that about, right? That cultivate those experiences. And I can do that by the way I act in real life in the situation. So notice how I'm using my power of influence to create good experiences by altering the day-to-day -day flow of events, social events, physical events, right? Things like that that happen. All right, let's keep going here.
We said it at the beginning of uh, this training, uh, how to use this power is pretty simple. Uh, most people think, you know, or act like they think that their imagination is strictly for daydreaming about, you know, their next boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody that they like. But actually, um, I'd like you to think of your imagination as a blueprint generator. Uh, basically, it's an idea generator. So Sean can imagine future potentialities, future realities that then Sean can uh, select from. Maybe I want to go to the beach next Friday. And so I'm going to come up with a plan now to make that a reality so that I can go to the beach next Friday um, when I come home from work I'd like to have this or that happen right so I'm gonna create a plan to make that experience come true um, I like to use the example of a wedding many people use this power that, to create experiences when they set up a wedding they might spend up to a year planning the wedding they they pick the perfect dress they pick the perfect tuxedo they pick the perfect kind of cake that they want they even pick the seats that their relatives are going to sit in right and what they're going to have to drink and eat there and how they're going to take pictures and so the reason they do this is because they want to have a good time right they're creating an experience so you too can use this power to create these good experiences so that when it comes you know in that example when it comes wedding day everybody just participates in sort of a natural free-flowing way and they have a great effect a great result right it all goes off hopefully according to plan and they have this great memory in the future to carry with them for the rest of their lives and it's all because they tapped into the flow of events and created an experience now my big question for people is how come we only use this power on our wedding day right or when it's the Super Bowl and we want to have a Super Bowl party how come we don't do this every day because guess what your life is a big event so obviously uh, with great power comes great responsibility as spider-man's grandfather said in that in the movie spider-man um, great power great responsibility so using your power to influence right there it's not just a free-for-all there are some rules <laughs> that we it's like a code of conduct right uh, the difference for example between an intentionally constructive change agent or a hero and a intentionally destructive change agent or what we might call a villain is specifically around personal responsibility ownership accountability to standards that support well-being and flourishing right the villain doesn't care about your humanity or their own humanity it's kind of like they put a boot on their own neck the inner them they they might tell themselves you know don't cry don't feel anything don't catch feelings you hear that a lot sometimes you know people joke about that I'm trying not to catch feelings well what's wrong with feelings right what's the problem with feelings well feelings you you feel hurt when bad things happen that's right so instead of just blocking out our feelings how about we stop doing bad things to each other that make people have hurt feelings and how about we learn how to manage our feelings and you know get that energy out that hurt out of our system whenever possible with the help of you know professional helping people uh, instead of just shutting down our own inner life instead of shutting down our own inner humanity so I take this um, power uh, very personally my personal response ability you could say response hyphen ability is to use my power of influence in ways that don't hurt me or others right or the world that I'm living in um, because why would I want to do that why, why would I want to hurt my own chances of of reaching self-actualization of having good relationships of maintaining a good rapport with others and of making that possible for my children and the people in my life right um, nobody wants really to have a crappy experience in life um, but what happens is we don't realize that 
uh, when we use our power in ways that hurts ourselves and others or disregards the humanity of ourselves or of the people around us uh, whom we interact with, uh, we're, we're doing a disservice to ourselves ultimately because when you mistreat people, guess what? They, they resent you. Um, whenever you hear stories about people dominating someone one way or the other, what happens in the long run? Either one person or a group of people comes back and confronts them, right? And uh, it's very uh, destructive often. So we don't want to um, make things harder on ourselves than they need to be. Uh, than they already are because we're already facing enough challenges in life without creating more problems. So it's important then when we use our power of influence that we do it in a way that is responsible. Uh, and we can demonstrate that responsibility by trying to monitor ourselves and what we're going through and how we're reacting, right? And when people push our buttons and they upset us, uh, you could kind of look at that as almost a way that life is using that person to reveal to you the parts of yourself that could be a threat to your own ability to be successful in life, right? Because let's say somebody um, does something that makes me feel overwhelmed and unappreciated. Well, maybe I feel like I want to lash out at them or I might want to talk back or argue with them or have some sort of conflict or maybe I just want to escape and evade them and get away from them and never come back and doing that would have maybe a bad effect on my finances or my resume or on my ability to have a loving partner or whatever right so when I feel provoked by someone or I feel upset with someone for something some people call it being triggered right by a stressor Instead of, you know, acting out and taking off and running away, I can just uh, look at that and go, okay, this part of me is upset. And I'm thinking about using my influence in a way that might be destructive of me or of others. Um, and if it's of others or towards others, it's going to be destructive of me in the long run because they're not just going to let this happen, right? They're going to resent me. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, there's going to be consequences, adverse consequences for my actions. Um, there always is, right? We call that karma. And it's not just an imaginary made up thing. It's just, you know, sort of a spiritual way of describing uh, this universal law of cause and effect, right? Things come back to us when we engage in patterns, right? So uh, when we get upset, we can choose to see those, those experiences as life kind of showing us that, um, you know, I don't want to do this behavior because if I do this, it's going to limit my ability to have an influence in my own life, right? If I'm in a prison cell, I'm not able to affect change at home, right? You know, when my family needs me. And I know a lot, I worked in the prison. I know a lot of people that have been incarcerated and they've told me that, that it's really difficult for them to know that they weren't able to be there for their family when they were incarcerated, right? So um, if you take off and leave town uh, because the heat's, you know, too hot, um, you might be leaving your family behind or your kids, right? And that's going to be really uh, destructive for them. And they're also going to resent you for that. So um, those are things we want to always just be aware of is we, with great power to influence comes great responsibility. So what can we do when people use their power for good? Well, just like the picture shows, you can high five that. We want to give people rewards and rewarding experiences. Uh, things like positive touch, positive, safe, safe, positive touch, right? Professional, safe, positive touch. We want to give them uh, rewarding experiences like a day off from work or go home early or pay increase or a raise, um, right? Or you want to give them uh, an attaboy or just tell them good job, you know, or I'm proud of you or thank you for being so patient with me. Thank you for being so flexible, you know, with the schedule. Thank you for uh, your help today. Thanks for not getting upset with me when I made a mistake, right? Um, I like to say that 
you should attend to that which you want repeated. So, and I like to also say that if it's devalued, it'll be mistreated. So if you don't want to mistreat something, don't devalue it. Uh, treat everything as if it has a high value uh, and reward anything that you want to see more of, right? So if you don't like it when your kid yells, then don't use your influence uh, to give them a reward when they yell, right? Use your influence to give them a reward when they're quiet or they're calm. Um, you don't like it when they make poor choices. Well, you don't have to scream and yell at them, right? Because that's not going to help them to make better choices. You just have to explain to them in a way that they will understand verbally uh, why it's important to do this or that a certain way, right? Because they need to, you know, upgrade their own programming and their own mind and brain like a computer program needs to be developed so that they can understand why it's important to do what you're saying. And um, hopefully if you're connected to your own humanity, right, you'll be able to uh, understand how to approach them in a way that doesn't destroy the human in them. Because we want to we want to be able to influence things without wrecking things, right? We said we want to be heroic and not villainous. So that's an example of how we can do that. So what kind of things drain your power or diminish your power of influence? Well, these are kind of intuitively obvious as well. If you think about it, probably high on the list would be hanging around people who don't like it when you make progress toward goals or don't like it when you excel in your own way or maybe they don't like it when you express yourself maybe they don't like it when you get involved right and so they're going to try to punish you when you use your power in ways that are constructive and catalytic in ways that build up and move progress forward uh, so it's going to be important that you pay attention to who you're hanging out with um, we always say in the recovery field that it's important to change people, places, and things if you want to get different outcomes, and that's true. I like to recommend, you know, being aware of yourself and others and uh, behavior that you see around you and what you're doing, you know, and try to understand the meaning of it. Um, and uh, other things that are going to diminish your influence or drain your power, obviously, uh, you know, uh, self-talk telling yourself things, negative self-talk, telling yourself things that, you know, you can't do it or you're bad or you suck or you should just give up or no one's going to like you or you'll never amount to anything or you can't overcome stuff, you know. All those negative self-defeating thoughts are going to diminish your ability to have influence if you, if you allow them, if you allow yourself to entertain them. Uh, your mood could affect you know the way you use your power so it's going to be important that you pay attention to that and get any sort of uh, help with any mental health symptoms you might be dealing with or psychiatric stuff you could talk to a psychologist about that or a counselor mental health counselor um, other things that might drain your power not believing in yourself right a sense of worthiness or um, that you're not good enough a feeling of being insignificant those things are also not going to help you out um, so you want to be in situations uh, where you can boost your power, right? And uh, what boosts your power? Like I said earlier, being around supportive people, um, getting more education, studying people that use their power of influence in positive ways, uh, learning about how to overcome, um, being positive with yourself, right? Being optimistic, assuming the best and uh, obviously um, there's another form of power that I like to talk about too sometimes and that is your your physical energy or your life force right some people might call it your spiritual power and uh, it's important to get enough sleep at night right like I like to get seven and a half hours of sleep try to eat enough fruits and vegetables get at least a couple hours of exercise a week uh, stretching is really helpful and uh, keep that energy you know in your system I don't like to spend time around people that engage in a lot of negative attention seeking uh, with me because maybe they would like for me to drain my my energy, my physical energy by arguing with them all day. Or maybe people would prefer it if I was overwhelmed and overloaded 
because then if I'm super stressed, I'm not working on these kind of cool trainings, you know, that could help improve situations that I'm in. Um, maybe I'm not pursuing other personal goals, right? So I want to be aware of both my physical energy and also where is my focus, right? Um, there's always competing demands on my time and attention. And uh, that can be in, uh, on my energy. So I want to try to be in situations that I call empowerment zones, right? When I mentioned earlier about creating situations that are good for you and others, uh, one of the ways I like to describe that is that it's very empowering. Um, it gives you energy, right? And just like some of those old video games, uh, race car games from the 80s where uh, I think it was F-Zero it was called, where you would drive your little space car around the track and every so often there was like a little pink neon section and when you went across it, it would boost your speed. And that's the way I think of empowerment zones, right? If you wanna, if you wanna boost your employee productivity, you wanna, if you wanna boost your own productivity and the quality of your own choices and decisions, and you wanna boost your own influence, well then you're gonna wanna be in situations where you're not being mistreated, instead you're being supported, you're being given the tools you need, right? You're being shown how to do things. People don't get envious of you when you do well, Instead, they, they feel thankful that you're doing well because they want to move forward, too. They realize that a rising tide raises all boats, right? So those are the kind of situations we want to be in there. All right, last big thing for us to talk about. What do you need to develop in order to increase your positive impact potential? Let's see. First thing I want you to try to practice is to engage with your day-to-day -day life right don't be a bystander don't just stand by when things are happening that you would like to happen try to get involved and see if you can take steps to make them happen right you don't have to dive right in with the scary stuff at first you don't have to go up to like the the most terrifying monster in your life and confront it or anything right we don't even really want to confront people about their character flaws because trust me i've done that and nobody likes it when you put a magnifying glass on what they what you think is wrong with them, right? They just think you're judging. Um, but it is good to get involved with your day-to-day -day life and start to just try to make things happen, right? See if you maybe you can uh, be more honest about what you really want, right? Uh, and maybe say no to the things that you really don't want. So just getting involved at all, get out of the reclining chair, you know, turn off the TV, and start actually working on something, right? Paint a picture, write a poem, uh, start working on your book or your novel, go to the gym, lift some weights, like the guy in the picture here. Just doing anything at all that's productive and helpful um, is a way that you're being social with your world, right? You're, you're relating to life and it's gonna make you feel better when you get involved, usually, than it would be if you're just sitting on the sidelines, right? Um, so if that's, Number one, just to have any influence at all, that's gonna be important. Number two thing with that is, uh, or the second thing, is engaging in intentional strategic action, right? This is what both villains and heroes do. People who are intentional. This means, you know, you can walk into the wind. The wind might be trying to push you one way or the flow of events is headed in one direction, but you're heading in a different direction, right? This one can take a minute to figure out like what the right thing is to do because maybe you feel like your higher power or life or like a mystical force is trying to get you to go one way and that's why there's pressure being put on you, right? Sometimes I like to say, go with the green light, right? If life has given you a red light, it probably means you shouldn't keep going. But then the other question is, you know, maybe there's another aspect of the universe that isn't so friendly to you. Maybe it doesn't really want you to be well and do well and reach your potential and create positive change, right? It's that part we might call like the system, right? Or the oppressor, uh, some sort of negative energy force in the universe, the yin yang thing to go with the good side or the positive force, right? And if that's true, then uh, that side of the, you know, reality might try to get you to stop making positive changes, in which case you should be intentional and push through to keep going, right? In order to overcome obstacles and opposition. And if you're like an entrepreneur, you know that you have to do that. There's like a dark night of the soul where 
it takes forever. Like it's taken me 10 years, you know, and I'm still working on some of my projects. But I've also made a lot of progress and I didn't give up, right? So number two on my list here after those first two parts of the number one is uh, self-directedness and freedom of thought. This is one that I think is directly under assault here in our society in America. Uh, the TV and news and uh, other forms of influence, you know, they don't really want you thinking for yourself uh, because why would they, right? They'd rather you just buy the products that they're selling in the commercials and just do what you're told, you know, and uh, keep letting someone else benefit from your effort, right? Um, so if you think for yourself, you might question authority. You might talk back, you might argue, you might defy a few things. And, um, you know, that's maybe a bad thing if you have someone in charge of you that is a rational authority figure that treats you with kindness and concern for your humanity, right? They, they see their own humanity. They relate to themselves in a way that's humane. And so they're also going to relate to you in a way that's humane. Maybe that is someone that you want to let make decisions for you. But if it isn't, then uh, they probably don't have your best interest in mind. And so why would you want them to, uh, you, you wouldn't want to outsource your thinking to them is what I'm saying. So this is kind of uh, something that I heard uh, a guy named Noam Chomsky once describe as intellectual self-defense. It's important for you to be able to think things through, to look for uh, evidence that might support a claim that someone is making for you to maybe go on YouTube and teach yourself a little bit about fallacies of argumentation so that you can tell when someone is uh, trying to bullshit you, right, so to speak. Um, and you can learn to do the research for yourself and uh, just be willing to figure out, you know, whatever happens, happens. I just want to know the truth, whatever it is. Uh, the objective reality that we all can see is obvious, right, when we look around with our eyes and we hear with our ears using the scientific method of inquiry, right? Whenever you think something might be a certain way, you can formulate a little hypothesis and say, yeah, I think it is this way, or I think it's not this way. And then you can look for data, do an experiment, research, try to find out if there's any evidence that, that it is what you think, or evidence that it's not what you don't think it is, right? Whatever. And then if you find the evidence, great. And if you don't, you can do another, um, experiment but the point is it's you you're the one that's protecting your freedom of thought and your ability to make free choices uh, there's a guy named uh, Jack Mesereau who used to study adult education and one of the things I like that he said is uh, who benefits by me thinking this who benefits by me doing this me or my oppressor and, you know, if you've ever been in an abusive relationship with somebody, you know that it's no fun when they're trying to coerce your compliance with threats of punishment or trying to gaslight you and get you to, like, give up your own thinking process by making you think that you're dumb or crazy um, so that you'll let them be in charge of your mind, right? Because all they're really doing there is they're abusing their power, right? That's one of those examples of someone that's not using their power in a responsible way. They're abusing their power. They're trying to get you to give up your influence uh, so that they can get your influence to work for them, right? So that they can have not only themselves working on their behalf, but also you. But without having to have regard for your humanity, without having to think about how it affects you, how many people do you probably know or have seen on the news or TV that got in trouble because they were the getaway driver? or they went and did something for someone that told them to do it. Maybe they threatened them and they, the person thought, okay, I'll just give in to this person's first demand. And then later on, uh, it actually went against them and the person did something worse to them. So it's important to protect your self directedness and your freedom of thought. Third big thing on, you know, stuff to develop in order to increase your positive impact potential is self love, right? Heroes have a healthy version of narcissism. They love themselves in a way that is appropriate. Um, people we call villains in the movies, they have an unhealthy narcissism, right? It's okay to take selfies of yourself. It's okay to want to look good. 
it's okay to want to be admired, right? We all want to be appreciated. We all want to feel significant. Uh, what's not okay is to put yourself above others, right? Or to have others uh, go above you, right? We want to have a balanced caregiving style. And that's what I mean by moral engagement. Um, what I mentioned at the beginning of the training, you know, in terms of uh, why you should make good choices, right? And why we are intervening to improve situations is so that you can achieve self-actualization, have good experiences socially, experience emotional well-being uh, by, by having a nutrient-rich social environment, right, where people are treating you well. And the way you get that is by having and adhering to an agenda of life and aliveness, doing things that promote uh, well-being. A famous German philosopher named Eric Fromm once said, good is that which promotes life and aliveness, and evil is that which strangles it. And I tend to agree with that. So it's important, whatever your morals are, that you have a moral compass or a moral philosophy of some kind. Even if we were born, let's say, without you know the classic conscience, um, this is where religion and philosophy can come in handy, is that maybe we can learn a moral compass. We can figure one out, right? What's your idea of good? What's your idea of evil? For me, good is that which builds up and uh, promotes movement towards a goal. So it's constructive and catalytic. And evil is that which, like Eric Fromm said, it, it ruins things, right? Evil is destructive and derailing. It prevents you from being able to move toward your goals and in a way that's constructive for yourself and others. So if you can love yourself, have this balanced caregiving style, you'll be obviously demonstrating that through your win-win behavioral strategies. Uh, you'll, people will say that you have a teamwork orientation, right? Because in every decision that you make, you're doing what's good for yourself and the other guy in terms of their humanity, right? Like, yes, I'm going to go ahead and pursue my personal goals, but I'm not going to do it in a way that's uh, selfish, right? Or that disregards your humanity. So maybe I want to work on a program on my computer, but I have a child who is looking at me like they want to hang out with me, right? So I can pause what I'm doing on the computer and go spend some time with my child. And then once their need is met, right, and we've had a good experience together, I can go back to my computer and I can finish the project, right? So in that way, I've just engaged in a win-win strategy with my child and with myself and my goals. Um, it just takes a little bit longer and you have to be willing to sacrifice a little bit in the moment, right? Um, number four on my list of things to develop in order to increase your positive impact potential is vulnerability and calculated risk taking, right? Heroes are willing to take social risks. Brene Brown talks about this all the time. She talks about courage as being wholehearted. And I've also found this to be correct in terms of why people uh, who disregard the boundaries of others end up getting left behind, right? Whenever you use a force strategy or a behavioral strategy that is meant to avoid vulnerability to try to you're trying to limit the risk to yourself you automatically end up creating more damage um, in other words whenever you try to avoid vulnerability you're always going to get the opposite of what you want this is what i learned working with men in the domestic violence field for like three years um, Anytime somebody felt maybe like their partner didn't like them or was going to leave them, if they tried to coerce that person's compliance with threats of punishment, the person always ended up leaving, right? And so the, the guy that did that in my example, let's say in a heterosexual relationship, he ends up getting left behind after he attempted to coerce uh, his female partner's behavior with threats of punishment, right? Maybe he was physically violent. And so he used his power of influence in a way that was destructive and derailing. And you see how it made his partner resent him. And then uh, because she was correct in her view that that's not a safe situation, it's not good for her, she chose to leave him eventually, right? And uh, so vulnerability and calculated risk-taking are important. I've noticed a lot of people make 
poor choices in terms of when they use their influence, when they um, take unnecessary risks, right? They're willing to drive drunk, but they're not willing to go to AA because it might be embarrassing, right? So they, they want to avoid the risk of being embarrassed, but they're okay taking the risk of getting killed in an automobile accident by driving under the influence, impaired, right? So we don't want to take unnecessary risks when we're trying to use our influence in a way that will help us to stay empowered. Uh, instead, we want to take calculated risks. Um, I'm doing this behavior, I'm using this plan or these strategies because I believe they're going to work. I've thought them through, right? A lot of times when people commit crimes, later on you find out that they didn't really think it through. They didn't really think about the outcome uh, in the long run. They were just kind of being short-sighted and thinking about how they could use the easy money, the quick money. They wanted respect right now and they were gonna try to demand it. And so in the long run, what happened? They ended up getting arrested. They ended up losing their family. They couldn't come back out into the community for years, whatever it is, or they could lose their life or have their kids taken away or something. So it's important that we try to be discerning, right? About who it's okay to be vulnerable around. It's not always okay to be vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable around anybody, right? Because we don't wanna just expose ourselves to the possibility of being hurt, right? Uh, or being damaged in some way um, by sharing personal information or our hearts with people that would uh, trample them or step on them, right? So number five, courage, um, assertive problem solving and assertive communication. I mentioned that courage means living wholeheartedly. Uh, so we're gonna use that kind of bravery stuff, right? That people talk about in the movies. Um, and we're gonna, instead of fighting or fleeing when we're triggered by somebody that's provoking us or we're feeling stressed about some sort of issue or event coming up, instead of fighting it or fleeing from it, and some people also fawn over their oppressor, right? They fawn over their abuser, they fawn over the problem causing agent. Um, and we don't wanna fawn either because that's just a strategy to you know avoid being mistreated, right? Uh, without actually um, confronting the real issue, which is that something is harming us or it's bad for us. So instead of fawning, uh, fighting or fleeing, we wanna focus, we wanna hone in on what's in front of us and uh, focus on it, right? We don't wanna have tunnel vision because we don't wanna like lose sight of what's going on around us and in the situation. I've, I, I know in the past I've, uh, missed opportunities to apply for college uh, degrees uh, because I was too busy arguing with my family members, you know, for weeks at a time or something about some dumb issues. So it's important to not uh, focus too much on the problem, but my point is don't avoid dealing with it, right? I once uh, had a job uh, working as a pizza guy and a uh, roommate and a girlfriend, and I ended up making poor choices. I I had issues to deal with with all those different areas of my life and I my car needed maintenance and I didn't get help for it. My roommate needed me to pay rent and I didn't pay. My girlfriend needed me to talk to her about what was bothering me. I didn't do it. And guess what happened? One day my car burned, burst into flames and burned down. I lost my job. My roommate kicked me out for not paying rent and my girlfriend and I broke up. So. I learned the hard way there that you don't want to avoid problem solving. You need to learn how to face problems so that they don't get worse by you ignoring them. Because eventually they're gonna get so big that there's no way to solve them without it coming back on you somehow. Uh, number five is, the rest of the number five there is uh, assertive communication, right? Intentionally constructive change agents, they don't beat around the bush, they don't stab you in the back, they, they say things to your face, right? And uh, this is thing, something that heroes and villains usually have in common is uh, most people that are um, empowered, whether they do it for good or evil, uh, they're gonna do it straight up. You know, They don't have a problem uh, confronting you about it or confronting the situation. So we wanna learn how to face things head on. Um, and number six, distress tolerance and impression management, right? Facing things head on can cause a lot of distress, right? Reality is a leading cause of stress. So it's gonna be important that when you are embroiled in some sort of healthy social conflict or you're trying to initiate a positive change, 
you're going to want to make sure that you're able to tolerate the level of distress that you're going to be in. Like they say, even if your voice shakes, you should still use it. Um, you're going to want to be able to control your reactions, right? You got to learn how to control your reactions when people push your buttons, uh, when you feel like lashing out or giving in or acting out um, because you might want to give up even, right? You want to learn how to tolerate distress without doing any of those things, without giving in, without giving up, without acting out, without lashing out, out at the person because all those things are going to screw up the progress you've made and they're going to end up getting you arrested or getting you in trouble. You might lose your job and then you're not going to be able to use your power of influence in those areas anymore, right? You're going to lose the ground that you've gained. So in order to hold the ground that you've gained um, when you were making all those good choices previously, it's going to be important that you can tolerate distress um, and manage the impression that you're having on others, right? This is something that some of your greatest movie villains and real life villains are good at. They're good at acting like everything's okay, even though they're doing bad things. And as a heroic person, as someone who's trying to live heroically as an empowered individual, you're going to want to try to maintain a good impression on other people as well, especially when you're feeling uh, distressed. Because when you make good choices and you're having a high le level of influence and you're effective at what you do, uh, you're excelling in certain areas, People are going to get upset with you. They're going to get envious. They're going to try to stop it. They're going to try to sabotage it. And they're going to do this by trying to hurt your feelings. They're going to try to throw you off emotionally, get you to uh, misstep somehow so they can be justified in doing something further to you, right? So one of the ways that you can prevent that from happening is by managing your impression. Because a lot of times, the only thing that actually gets you in trouble is, you know, when you actually lose control of your emotions or you you choose to allow yourself you give yourself permission to act out because you think you know yeah this person deserves it or geez this person disrespected me so now i can disrespect them or they did something to me so i'm allowed to do something back and when you give yourself permission to act out or to make those types of poor choices it's a it's a mistake it's a trap right because you're going to end up losing your influence in the long run when you get arrested when you lose the family connection or the support or the job or the resume so again distress tolerance and impression management are really important if you want to maintain your personal power and to uh, hold whatever ground you've gained along the way uh, number seven self-monitoring limit setting and boundaries I mentioned this earlier it's important to monitor how you're doing how are you feeling what are you doing to to um, manage your own thoughts. Are you entertaining the kind of thoughts that help you to get further or the kind that, that are more likely to defeat you or to get you to quit or give up or act out, right? Um, can you set limits? Are you able to say no? Can you set boundaries with others, right? Uh, there's some great stuff on YouTube about boundaries with Brene Brown. Uh, limit setting is some stuff that I like to talk about on YouTube. Um, but basically what it means is, you know, can I let these people know where they end and I begin or where I end and they begin, right? I appreciate your support, but I don't want you to be a doormat around me because I'm not, I'm not the muddy boots that want to step on you. So please stop, you know, trying to enable me or please stop making excuses for me or you know, inviting me to do worse than I am now. Like I'm trying to do better than I am now. Or on the flip side, right? Somebody might be crossing into your turf. And so you've been the doormat and now you want to say, listen, I, you know, I apologize if I gave you the impression that it was okay for you to walk on me, but it's really not, you know, I don't like it when people step on me or step on my toes. Uh, um, I actually don't really like the thing that I've been acting like I like. And so we need to kind of make some you know, upgrades to our day-to-day -day way of doing things because I haven't really been being as honest as I should be, right? Maybe when you go through the McDonald's drive through you can say no when they ask if you want to supersize your meal, right? That's a way of setting a limit in a non-threatening situation. And then eventually you might have to take your power back from whatever person in your life that you gave it away to, right? For me, that was my bio dad. Um, I never really wanted to tell him the truth, you know, 
hey, dad, actually, you did hurt my mom. Actually, you did hurt my family uh, when you were using, you know, crystal meth and drinking alcohol and leaving town to go to Vegas. Right. And I, I always let you get away with, uh, you know, telling me that you never did those things. But really, you did. And uh, I just need you to know that I, I love you and I, you know, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or anything, but um, I'm not going to let you keep saying that lie to me without me confronting the truth of it, right? Because uh, previously, when I wasn't confronting the truth of it, I would go out and drink and uh, smoke cigarettes and stuff and, and get drunk and treat people poorly because I was not um, living my truth, right? I was betraying myself and my real life experiences that I had lived with my dad. So that's just an example of limit setting and boundaries. Uh, they're really important. Uh, number eight is emotional self-care and stress management. Heroes take time to unwind and relax, right? If you want to keep being an empowered individual, you got to pay attention to how you're doing emotionally and to be willing to make time for self-soothing behavior. That means, you know, get a massage, let somebody rub your feet, sit on the couch, you know, put your feet up, watch a TV show. Go sit in a sauna or jacuzzi, do some stretching, go to the gym, uh, get the right kind of, you know, situation that you need to help your mood uh, as long as it's safe and legal um, and do something to manage, you know, that stress that you've been under. Like I said, the distress, right? Um, it's going to build up energy in your body system. I like to say that we each have like a five gallon pail in our bodies of energy. You know, it's not really physical there. It's just a metaphor. But uh, once that bucket gets filled, right, it's going to tip out on people that don't deserve it, maybe, or it's going to tip out in ways that gets you to act out. And uh, rather than doing that, or you might try to suppress it and pretend that it's not, you know, filled to the brim with, you know, painful energy, you might end up trying to use drugs or alcohol to numb out that pain that it's causing, right? But if you're taking appropriate care of yourself emotionally, and finding ways to get that stressful energy out of your body in a way that's safe and legal, uh, then you're going to be doing much better. Also, uh, one going back to the limit setting thing, one thing I didn't mention that I personally like to use as a template when I have to set limits with others is I like to say, uh, you're cool, we're cool, but that's not cool. So, you know, I like you and I want to have a good relationship with you, um, but I really don't like it um, when people swear around me. Or maybe I really don't like it when people wear yellow t-shirts around me because I once, you know, had something bad happen with a yellow t-shirt. Whatever it is, you just basically let them know what your limit is and you can do it that way. Hey, find some way to say it's it, you're a good person. This isn't about you and we're cool. I'm going to still be your, your brother or your friend or your coworker. I'm still going to like you and want to hang out with you. But I need for this thing to change or whatever this behavior is, right? Uh, that's what I like to use. Uh, you're cool, we're cool, but that's not cool. Number nine, delayed gratification, faith, and a growth mindset. Basically, if you're going to be an empowered individual that maintains your power, you're going to have to be willing to make temporary sacrifices, right? Short-term suffering for long-term gain. I mentioned that earlier. Like, I want to work on my program on my computer, but I also want my child to have an enriched you know, life where we get to have positive interactions and do things together so instead of just spending the whole day on my computer i'm going to make time for me and my child to do some fun stuff together and that way uh, my project will get finished eventually and i'll have a you know a healthy happy child and a good good uh, behavior as a parent um, it's going to be important when i encounter setbacks that i have faith that I can achieve my goals and that things will work out eventually if I keep going, right? Uh, so we, we want to try to keep faith alive and uh, believe that something good can happen. It doesn't mean you're religious or anything. It just means that you have faith that, you know, something good can happen if you get involved. You have faith that you'll be well received by others. And you're going to fail a lot, right? I don't even really believe in the word failure. Um, but I like that some of the people that I work with and have our friends with talk a lot about the importance of just continuing on when you fail and not just giving up, right? The only way to really fail is to just stop trying and, and to be defeated, right? So 
as long as you get back up and try, try again, you're not, you're never a failure. Um, and that's where a growth mindset comes in, right? Some people have a fixed mindset. You know, when I was in fifth grade, my teacher might have said that I was bad at math or something. And now 30 years later, I still think I'm bad at math. That's having a fixed mindset. Um, I don't believe that I can ever, you know, tolerate my coworkers being better at math than me because it triggers that stressor. It always makes me feel like a failure whenever I think about anyone else being better at math than me. And so I end up envying everybody because of that fixed mindset. But when I can have a growth mindset, I can believe that anything is possible. I can learn new things if I just practice. I can get new things if I don't give up. And if I'm doing things in a way that's socially appropriate and strategically effective, right? Um, and I'm willing to persevere and get through the tough times that I can get what I want and I can actualize uh, my vision for the future. So that leads us to number 10, passion, self-discipline, and grit. Uh, grit's a con concept by Angela Duckworth. Basically, it just means that you're passionate about something that you want to do, right? It's uniquely you. Uh, it's one of your strengths, something you love to have going on. It's a creative project of yours. And um, you're going to be willing to persevere, to put a high level of effort into achieving uh, that experience or creating that experience or achieving that result. And uh, one of the hardest things is you're going to have to learn how to develop self-discipline, right? I, this was hard for me because growing up, I went through a lot of unpleasant situations. And so I didn't really want to make myself have to go through anything unpleasant, right? You know, going to the gym is kind of unpleasant sometimes if you think about how you have to lift weights and eating healthy can be unpleasant if you feel like it's not you know, enjoyable and sweet. Um, but, and, and, and when someone provokes you, it might feel good to immediately lash out at them and let all that energy out back towards them. That might feel good in the moment. To, it's cathartic, right? It's like crying your eyes out. It gets the feelings out. Um, punching that punching bag might feel good because it gets the energy out of your body. But um, maybe you're in a situation where that wouldn't be appropriate to do those things, right? So, or to act out. So you need to have self-discipline uh, so that when you your body wants to give up or quit uh, or you are mentally starting to feel like maybe I can entertain these excuses or these um, thoughts that are telling me to act out or to give up or to give in or whatever, instead of doing that, you're going to be self-disciplined. And uh, you're going to, like another uh, meme that I've seen on the internet, I think it says, uh, uh, self-discipline means uh, doing not doing what you want now because you're going to do what you want most, right? So what do I really want? Do I want to lash out at this person? Kind of, yeah. But what do I rather have more than that? I'd rather be a success in life. I'd rather have a great job that I love, doing something I'm good at, that I enjoy, uh, getting paid a lot of money, having a good life with my child, um, you know, whatever. So instead of doing that thing in the moment impulsively, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffer in that moment, so to speak, for the long-term gain of uh, getting further than I would if I had done that. So, uh, guys, that is it. We've been about an hour and 19 minutes so far. So, uh, thanks for sticking with me, or maybe you watch this in little bits. But I uh, really enjoyed talking to you about personal empowerment. Uh, I hope that you continue on your journey to be an empowered individual. If you would like more information about me and all my little ideas here that I've shared, uh, you can go to uh, WordPress, excuse me, uh, herosupportguy.wordpress.com. Uh, that's www.herosupportguy.wordpress.com. And um, if you would like to contribute to the work I'm doing financially, um, you could go to patreon.com slash Mr. Hero Support, patreon.com slash Mr. Hero Support, and become a member of what I call the community of empowered individuals. And that'll give you an opportunity if you'd like to join me every Tuesday night at seven for uh, what I call coffee with a friend. Uh, me and the other members of the community get together and we just encourage each other and talk about how things are going. And uh, anyways, guys, uh, if you'd like to uh, email me about something in this training, uh, you can do that. Just send your email 
to my uh, Gmail account. It's SeanFury77 at gmail.com. And the 77 are in the number format. So SeanFury77 at gmail.com. All right. I think that is it for me. And uh, I will talk to you all later. Thanks for participating here in the training.